Pickles or stones, that's all I've got to say to you lot. <laughs> so what's the title of the message this morning? Is it up there? Get back to where we once belonged. As you can see, I'm a Beatles fan. <laughs> So I can keep with you. Yeah, get back to where we once belonged. If you would just turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis 2, verses 5 to 25. I'm going to read through that scripture. At the time, God made earth and heaven before any grasses or shrubs had sprouted from the ground. God hadn't yet sent rain on earth, nor was there anyone around to work the ground. In fact, the whole earth was watered by underground springs. God formed man out of dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. Then God planted a garden in Eden. In the east, he put the man he had just made in it. God made all kinds of trees grow from the ground, trees beautiful to look at and good to eat. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there divides into four rivers. The first is named Pishon. It flows through Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of this land is good. The land is also known for a sweet-scented resin and the onyx stone. The second river is named Gihon. It flows through the land of Cush. The third river is named Hiddekel and flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. God took the man and set him down in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. God commanded the man, You can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion. So God formed from the dirt of the ground all the animals of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man named the cattle, named the birds of the air, named the wild animals. But he didn't find a suitable companion. God put the man into a deep sleep. As he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman and presented her to the man. The man said, finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Name her woman, for she was made from man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. That's kind of a nice picture to me. One of the very first scriptures in the Bible, right at the beginning of the Bible, God has already made the heavens and the earth. And then he makes this garden, the Garden of Eden. And the description there seems to me really rather perfect. It seems fantastic. It seems like a place that might be really quite nice to go to. This morning, um, when we were worshipping, it was quite emotional. Did you feel the emotion behind that? And actually, when Gary got up, he used that word, and that's exactly the word that was on my mind. I was thinking, wow, this is really quite deep. This is emotional. And I think this morning, the subject, the firm foundation subject that we're going to talk about is lordship. Uh, and so I was beginning to think, wow, God, you know, this worship time that we're having together here, that's really powerful. It's really deep. It's emotional. It's about, you know, how you, can, you provide everything. You are good. You want good things for us. Uh, and I knew the subject that I was going to talk about. And I think it's kind of interesting how the two things are going to link together. Because a lot of the feelings I had this morning were, I think, you know, the kind of feelings, that God, let's call them Garden of Eden feelings, where you just feel great. You don't always know, you know, you can't always explain what it is, but you know you feel the presence of God in you as you're worshipping. And we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the head knowledge behind how God works in our heart. So we're going to talk about lordship. So lordship, there's three points that I'm going to bring to you. What is it? Why is it important? 
and how do we observe it? So have we got to, let's go to the next slide if we can. Yeah, one further on. So you can't see that very clearly, but I looked. Actually, we've all got two, most people have, or pretty much everybody has, two fathers. Father in heaven. They may not realize he's their father in heaven, but he is there. And your father on earth. I'm quite unusual because I can actually call both of my fathers Lord. <laughs> my father actually is a Lord, uh, as it happens. So I looked on the internet and I wondered how much it cost to, to become a Lord. <laughs> And do you know, you can actually buy lordship. It's actually true. Or ladyship, you can even buy that. It, apparently, it costs $24.95 to become a lord. <laughs> <laughs> I never told my dad that, I think. <laughs> and it costs $24.95 to become a lady. So we've got gender equality in lordship as well, apparently. But even better than that, if you buy the two together, it's $36.95. So you get a deal. <laughs> So is that lordship? Well, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> also, lordship, this idea of lordship, there was that great um, trilogy of films, wasn't there? By Tolkien. The films weren't by Tolkien. But the book was by Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings. Who, who watched The Lord of the Rings? Yeah, I love The Lord of the Rings. It was just fantastic. Shot in New Zealand. You know, the, the scenery was amazing. The characters are really incredible. It's, it's kind of two and a half or three hours of just you're able to go to the movies and transport yourself into a, another existence, aren't you, basically? And that's what I loved about Lord of the Rings. But, of course, if your impression about lordship is from Lord of the Rings, it's about fighting, it's about trying to gain power, it's about good versus evil, it's about all of those things. But uh, there are so many different characters involved there. Some are flawed, some are, well, they're all flawed, really. Some are um, it, nice and easy to get along with, others not so easy to get along with. Is that our version of lordship? Well, maybe there's a little bit in that. That's kind of an earthly version, if you like, or, or a, you know, how we've imagined uh, lordship could be. Is Lord of the Rings it? Mm, maybe not. The kind of lordship that we're going to talk about this morning is the lordship of God, lordship that exists in heaven. And actually, there's a book in the Bible that... Um, is a very complicated book, uh, or at first, when you first read it, it seems to be very complicated, and I'm going to try and do a difficult thing, and in about five or ten minutes, just kind of give you a synopsis of this book. This book is one of my favorite books, actually. Um, I've been reading through the Bible every year for the last two or three years, and every time I come to this book, I actually start to feel a bit excited about it, because you can get something new from it every time. So it is the book of Job. Now, Job, let me tell you the story of Job and how, how this works out. Job is actually not, he was not Jewish. Uh, he was not from Israel at all. But God said of Job, he, he was a wealthy man, and he had uh, many cattle and sheep and, you know, a uh, big family. He was somebody who was seen around town as a blessed person, someone who was really a good person as well. And God said about Job, look at my servant Job. Look how good he is. And um, as the story goes in, in the Bible, Satan said to him, by the way, I learned um, uh, this week that the word Satan in, in um, Hebrew is the accuser. That's what it means. That's how the word works. So the accuser, okay? So the accuser came to God and said, well, hold on a second, God. You say this man, Job, is a really good man. But that's because you protect him. Of course he's good. It's easy to be good when everything's going nice and when everything's going well. You let me give him a little bit of hardship, then you watch. He'll soon change his tune. He'll change his mind. So God says, and this is where, you know, if you're in a movie, it'd be dun, dun, dun. God says, okay, I'll let you do that. Hold on a minute. What did I just say there? God said, yes, you can have your way with my servant Job. That doesn't sound like the God that I serve. That doesn't sound necessarily like the God that we were singing about, does it? That's a bit confusing, that. But that's what God said. Now, that seems unjust. And in actual fact, the book never really answers the question of why God allowed the devil, Satan, to basically get stuck into Job. It never really answers that question. But the book begins to answer something that is perhaps far more important and far more profound. So that's what that Satan does. 
uh, very quickly. He lose, Job loses all his possessions. He loses some of his family members. He breaks out in rashes. Uh, and he is in a really, really, becomes in a really difficult and dark place. And maybe this happened over a, a period of a few weeks or months. I don't know. It doesn't, it's not very clear about that. But Job finds himself in probably the darkest place you could ever find yourself in. And incidentally, God said that Job was blameless. And at the beginning of this story, he said, throughout all that happened in this book, Job never sinned. Job was innocent. God said that about Job. So you can imagine Job's mentality. What have I done to deserve this? I don't really understand what I've done to deserve this. And so along come three, they're called Job's comforters. Uh, and he asks, Job says to his, they're his friends, he says to them, can you help me? What, what has happened? Why has this happened? And so they make a really important assumption. And it's an assumption probably every one of us has made in this room too. Because often when I read Job, I read what the comforters say, and I know that they're, they're kind of the villains in a sense, but I, I read their opinions and I think, oh, I could have said that. That sounds a bit like maybe what I would have advised Job if I was there. And the comforters make this assumption. They assume that God is just, and therefore, if something that is happening to you is not just, you must have done something to deserve it. That's basically what they say. And so Job goes through, there's many chapters uh, of this where they're talking to him and he's giving a defense for himself to say, but I'm innocent. I have done nothing wrong. I am innocent. And we know he's innocent because God already told us in the book he is innocent. So the comforters, they really brought a whole lot of confusion into the situation because they made this assumption that because God is just, if bad things happen to us, then it must be our fault. And that wasn't correct. There was a fourth comforter, a younger man, actually. Um, these comforters, they represent really Eastern wisdom uh, at the time. And uh, the, a sort of a, a, a how people used to view the world. If you do good things, good things happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things happen to you. And, th and that philosophy couldn't really fit into Job's experience. Uh, and the fourth guy comes along who's younger, and he says, well, it is true that God is just. We know that God is just, and we know that maybe you are innocent, Job. We, we don't know, but we maybe could consider that you are innocent because perhaps what God does is he's trying to use you as a lesson to other people. If you do, if you do bad things, this is what happens to you. And of course, that didn't seem so good, as you might imagine, to Job either. So amongst these four comforters, Job has got how much comfort? None. None at all. He's got no comfort whatsoever. So he begins to do probably what we would do in that situation. He begins to say, there's only two solutions to this. Either God, you are just, but you're incompetent because you've kept you've allowed an innocent man to suffer, or you're not just. Those are the two conclusions that he reaches, okay? And then, after many chapters of the book, God comes along. So, did we get the slide yet? God has no right to treat me like this. It isn't fair. That's where Job is. Then God arrives. Now, if, if you're God and you're now coming into the situation, imagine yourself in the courtroom and you're God, Job has accused you of being either incompetent or unjust, okay? As first lines of a defense go, this is a pretty good one. <laughs> because God said, hey, Job, I have some questions for you and I want some straight answers. Where were you when I created the earth? That's a pretty good line, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if you're making a movie about this, that's going to get in the movie. That doesn't get cut. That's a good one. And God continues on and talks about so many of his creations. And he says, where were you when I measured how large the earth was going to be? Where were you when I measured how much and what size the oceans and how deep the oceans were going to be? Where were you when I created all these different animals? 
If you were Job, imagine you're just accusing God here, and now God's directly talking to you, and you're beginning to get the message, aren't you? Ooh, I didn't think about that. That's I'm kind of bitten off more than I can chew maybe here. And the message to Job is this, and the conclusion that Job begins to reach, and what God's message to him is, your position, what you see, is just too small. It's too small to be able to judge Almighty God. That's what he's saying to Job. You cannot judge Almighty God. And he even says to Job, you try it for one day. Try judging the earth for one day. And Job begins to think about this and think, well, actually it's a bit more complicated than I might have imagined. Who's right and who's wrong? You know, so many different complex and complicated situations. So his conclusion was, God, you're right. I cannot judge how, how, who am I to judge you? He's famous. My dad always told me this um, line, actually. Uh, I, I remember it. Uh, so, I remember him telling me so many times. And it's the conclusion of Job. It's what Job's conclusion is. I, I find this a really powerful thing. Because this is what Job said. He said, before, my ears had heard of you. Now, before, God said he was an upright man. God almost, said, almost boasted, it sounded like, about Job. What a great man this is. But Job said about that moment, my ears had heard of you. But he says, but now my eyes have seen you. My eyes have seen you. What have they seen? His, his situation was still the same. It felt unjust. If we use our own version of what we think is right and wrong, if we use our own limited position to work it out, we would say the same as Job. We're, he was in that, still that same position of difficulty, but he was able to see, now, God, my eyes have seen you. I've understood who you are. I've understood your position, and I've understood my position. And then he said something really important. He said, I'm sorry. And he repented. He was still full of rashes. He still lost his um, livelihood. He'd still lost his wealth and riches and his family members. But he said, I'm sorry. And here's what God said to him. God said, I forgive you. And, you know, he didn't, he criti God criticized all the Job's counselors. And he said to them, I'm going to get my servant Job to pray for you. And if he prays for you, then I will forgive you. He didn't say their forgiveness was about... So, he, so Job was in the right here. And God never criticized Job. He didn't criticize Job, even when Job said, you're unjust. When, God, when, God, when Job accused um, God, God never criticized him. He said at the beginning, throughout this whole episode, Job was, Job was blameless. So, you know, when we're going through challenges, God doesn't... Um, he understands when we question He's a big God. He knows. He understands our position much better than we understand it. And when we get on our knees and say, God, I don't know why that's happened. I cannot understand this. I cannot understand the way I'm being treated or the situation that I find myself in. I can tell you God understands. And he doesn't mind us questioning him. It's really, really important that. And that story about Job, do you know what that's about? It's about lordship. Lordship is accepting authority even when it hurts and when you don't understand it. That's what lordship is. You know, you can say, I'm accepting authority. I know that in church we have this thing about having accountable relationships with each other. Okay, we, You get these accountability groups, not knocking that at all. That's a wonderful thing. But accountability very often, let me just be a little bit cheeky, very often, we see accountability as I'm in an accountability relationship with somebody until it is that they tell me something I don't want to hear. Then, they've got to be accountable to me because I'm going to tell them they're wrong. <laughs> That's kind of our version of accountability, right? That isn't lordship. That's not lordship, I can tell you. And, that, and the same thing happens with God. We can say, hey, this is what God says, or that's what God says. But God says what God says. And if we, are, if we truly are subjects of God, if God is truly our Lord, sometimes it's going to hurt. And sometimes that means we're going to do things that we don't really understand. That is a definition of lordship. So why is lordship important? 
We've got that picture up. Let's, can you get the picture? Yeah, there we go. Anyone recognize that? It's a bit hard to see it on the screen. Do you recognize that? Ah, who said Monet? Yes, Monet. It's not the painting. That is a garden in France, I think it's in northern France, that famously Monet painted. Now, I could have used lots of pictures of the Garden of Eden, and that's not the Garden of Eden, uh, lest you think I'm trying to say that. But that picture, I like it. I love it. it it's, it's nice. It's got balance. It's got green, different colors. It's got vibrant reds and purples and blues. It's got water in there, water lilies on there. That's a garden that I would like to spend a little bit of time in. I'm not any kind of gardener. My wife will tell you that. <laughs> uh, but I would enjoy to be there. That would be really nice. Genesis, that picture of Genesis, you know, the Garden of Eden. Well, it, does, it did sound nice. It was, it's peaceful words, isn't it? I know I read it from the message, and maybe some of you were struggling to follow it if you were using the NIV or King James or something. But I like the words. I like, it makes, makes you feel calm and peaceful. Let's go to the next slide. So this is, some of you might recognize this triangle. This is from a, um, a psychologist, I think, uh, in around about the 1940s, a very famous um, psychologist, a, a guy who wrote, who wrote this theory was called Maslow. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Anybody heard of it? Yeah, it's quite familiar, isn't it? I don't know if he was a Christian, but actually I think he, he was interpreting and understanding something about us that God laid down from the very foundations of the earth. Okay? So the way this um, works is it, the basic principle is the needs at the bottom, at the bottom of the triangle, they are our most basic needs, okay? And when mostly our needs, are, the most basic needs are met, we go up to the next level in the triangle, okay? And that those are needs that we have. Then when those needs are mostly met, we go up to the next level and so on. So at the very bottom, our most basic needs are air. We need air to obviously survive and to breathe. We need water, food, shelter, sleep. Clothing, reproduction, they are our most basic physical, physiological needs. And when mostly we feel satisfied about that, we can begin to think about the next level, which is then our security and safety, personal security, employment. You know, are we going to be able to survive, uh, not just today, but for the next month and the next six months and year? Resources, health, that's a very big topic at the moment. But that's one of our most basic needs on the second tier up. Uh, and property. When most of those needs are met, we begin to think about love and belonging, friendship. I, I know there are many friendships here. Uh, intimacy. And that's where we share our secrets with each other. That's where we share the things we really feel. Uh, one of the things that happens in worship, you know, because worship is about lordship too, right? Who are we worshiping? By worshiping God, we're saying, you have the authority. And there's an intimacy in that, isn't there? I, I felt that emotion this morning, and that, and I was worshiping with all of you, raising my hands. Maybe if I did that at my place of work, people would think I was gone crazy or something like that. But here we're doing that all together. There's a level of intimacy that we get from church. Family. We, we have our own families, but this is a family too. Sense of connection. So love and belonging, that's an important need that we have as human beings. And when that's mostly satisfied, we move, we're starting to get to the loftier things here. Esteem. We all need respect, self-respect, but respect from others. We need self-esteem. To think that we have a value, we have a place, that other people think that we are worthy and that they actually like us. Status, that's kind of important. Who am I? Who am I in my family? Who am I amongst my friends in my place of work? What, what is my position? Where do I slot in into life? Recognition from others. Strength, freedom, freedom. What was it? Mel Gibson and Braveheart. <laughs> so esteem, that's really important need for us. And the, the very top need is a thing called self-actualization. This word has been used by marketing people uh, almost like a weapon, uh, basically. You know, the idea is that you market a, a product to somebody and you get them to the place where they feel self-actualized, that this product is going to solve all their problems. No, nope, don't think that's going to happen. But self-actualization is the desire to become the most that we can be. Okay, so each level of need, when you basically satisfy the first one, 
you reach this point of self-actualization where we become the most we can be. You know what? When I looked at that, what I noticed, the Garden of Eden satisfies every single one of those. Every single one of them. Physiological needs. We read in the Bible that the trees provided shelter and they provided food. God provided sleep. Safety needs, personal security. It says in the Bible, the lion lays down with the lamb. So in the Garden of Eden with all the animals, they were not afraid. So the, they were safe. They had employment. God, God gave them, he said, you know, man needed to work the land and to keep the garden. So we had security. There was love and belonging. God gave man a woman, so you had intimacy and friendship and family. But God also walked among them. So there was that sense of connection to God, love and belonging, esteem. God said, I make these wonderful animals. And the detail, we know the detail that he put into the natural life around us, right? Some things are absolutely amazing, just incredible. Someone showed me an app this week. Um, it was to do with scuba diving, actually, because I quite like scuba diving. And you ever seen the Attenborough program about the emperor penguins? Well, this app showed the depth of the ocean, okay, and, and which fish you'd find at different levels in the ocean. Now, to give you an example, if, as a sort of amateur scuba diver, if you're d diving deep, you're getting to 40, about 40 meters. is about as deep as you can go, really, safely on oxygen. Then you have to start using other mixes of in nitrogen and this type of thing. So 40 meters, and at 40 meters, you can... You don't actually feel the pressure, but you know everything is much more intense. The air you, that you're using in your tank goes much more quickly. An emperor penguin can dive to 500 meters. The pressure, I mean, he, he, that's a land-living animal. He can't breathe underwater, okay? But he can dive to 500 meters. The, the deepest animals are something like about eight kilometers deep. I mean, the, that is just... To me, who understands a little bit about pressure of water and scuba diving, that is mind-boggling. So God put so much energy and attention to detail in these animals, but who did he give to name them? He said, the man is going to name them. That's a privilege. What a privilege God gave to us. And that gave us self-respect, self-esteem. It gave us status and recognition in front of God, our creator. Isn't that amazing? And that was in the Garden of Eden. And the desire to become the most that we can be, the self-actualization, we hit it. It was perfect. That, the, you read through the Garden of Eden, and it's, it was peaceful. In fact, the next slide is a quote, because I wanted to understand a bit about this. Albert Einstein said, God reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists. And it's that word harmony that I thought was really important. That's what I sensed and picked up from the Garden of Eden. It was harmony. And you can see, because all of our needs were met, and we were the most that we could be. How were we the most that we could be? Because we were in perfect union with God, and we understood his lordship. Remember, he, he said um, to Adam and Eve, he said, don't eat from the tree of good and evil. So he'd laid down an instruction, and to begin with, they obeyed. And God commune with them and converse with them, everything. That is a picture of wonderful harmony. And then if we click on to the next slide, which is the, actually the previous one again, then what happened? The serpent came along, right? And tried to convince, uh, tried to convince Adam and Eve of something different. Now, notice what the servant, serpent attacked. He didn't say... You're not very safe here, so you better get out. He didn't say, well, you know, the resources of the Garden of Eden, they're going to dry up, aren't they? So, you know, you better go somewhere else to try to find some more resources. He didn't say, you don't have the, the love and friendship uh, amongst yourselves and with God. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you're not respected either. He didn't say that. What did he say? He said... God has told you not to eat from the tree of good and evil because he knows that you can be more than you are. That's what he said. That's what the serpent said. He said, he's trying to keep you down. God is trying to make you less than you are. So the serpent appealed to the very top on this triangle, on this theory. 
He said, you can be more. And guess what? We believed it. We said, you know what? I think he might be right. We can be more. Why does God, who comes here every day to talk with us, why does he tell us not to eat from that tree? Where we, because, and it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of knowledge. I get it. He wants to keep us so that we don't know everything. Well, we can sort that out. <laughs> it would have been nice if it was a juicy red apple. I actually was imagining it in my mind, I have to say. That's my father-in-law, by the way. <laughs> He's about the only person, and, and my mother is here, but they're about the only two people in the room that are allowed to heckle me and get away with it. <laughs> but only once. <laughs> so we ate the apple. And in so doing, we suddenly, we suddenly did something really, really critical. Before, we had this perfect harmony where, we, where lordship to Father God was in evidence. And that was part of God's perfect plan. We were as much as we could be. We were perfect. They weren't ashamed about having no clothes. They, they didn't feel any shame. They felt self-esteem. They, they were provided for everything. This guy Maslow, he wasn't a Christian or a preacher or as far as I'm aware. But he said, he said, this is what we as humans need. He worked it out. We need these things. God provided them in the Garden of Eden. And we decided, actually, we can be a little bit more. You know what happens then? What happens then is we spend a few thousand years up to the present day trying to solve everything, trying to solve all these other things. Think of all the causes that we have. We have to be really clear about what I'm saying now, okay? There are so many causes that we have. Uh, in the world, environmentalism, gender equality, gender pluralism, socialism, capitalism, there's a lot of isms. What are they trying to do? What they're trying to do is they are trying to recover the position that we had previously. They're trying to get back to harmony in the world. That's what they're doing. We're, they're trying to find that harmony that once existed. We said, get back to where we once belonged. We belonged in the Garden of Eden in perfect harmony and the lordship with God. And we, because we failed at that, we're trying to solve the problem ourselves. Now, I am not criticizing those, um, you know, if, if, you, if you feel very strongly about the environment, I'm not criticizing that. If you feel strongly about socialism or capitalism or whatever political persuasion, I'm not criticizing that. But what I am saying is, be careful, because following that with your life is not going to get us back to what we really crave. That's not going to get us back to what we really crave. And you can have opinions one way or the other. I'm not going to comment on those, okay? But that is not the solution. That is not the solution. Rick Warren, oh, I did a little slide about world peace. Go on, let's have a look at that. World peace, mm, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. We already had world peace in the Garden of Eden. Rick Warren said something. And uh, this statement, when you first read it, it seems kind of a little bit, um, what's the word, trite almost. Um, but when you analyze it, there's real wisdom in this statement. So he said, Without God, life has no purpose. Well, actually, that makes logical sense. Because without, if there is no God, then we're here by accident. It just is a happy accident, right? So it does, we have no purpose. What does it matter if I'm good, a good person or a bad person? One day I won't be here, and all the people I've been bad to won't be here either. Nobody will remember that. What does it matter? There's no purpose to it. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Well, there's no purpose, so if I do well or don't do well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Oh, those are not very nice words, are they? I mean, you compare that to what I read earlier from Genesis about, how, you know, the vision of the Garden of Eden. But this is without God. And I can't find, if you try to, look at, if you try to think about this statement um, intellectually, I can't find any fault in that. It, it makes logical sense. And I think even people who don't believe God in some ways will say, actually, there is no purpose. That's really what they're trying to say. You know, we're here just by accident. 
Without God, life has no purpose. So why is lordship important? If you want purpose, if you want peace, if you want harmony, there's only one way to get that, and it's to acknowledge the lordship of Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Last point. How do we observe it? Well, I can tell you this is one slide. It's really simple. I'm going to put this slide up and let you let's go on to the next slide. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. That's how we do it. Not very complicated, this preaching business, is it? Kind of simple. I mean, Jesus said it in Matthew 12, uh, Mark 12, sorry. He said it in Mark 12. I've just got to say, you, say to you, that's it then. That's how we do it. Chris, you've been conning us all these years. <laughs> Where's Scott? Do you want to just come and... Yeah, just play a few things, because I want to... This is actually really... I want to bring some seriousness to this. That's what Jesus said. He was asked by the scholars. You know, if, if you ever read through the Gospels, Jesus was amazing. I mean, I know he was the Son of God, and so you might think he had a few advantages. Um, he was the Son of God, and he was crucified, and we, we focus on that. But look at the things that he said. My word, the wisdom. The wisdom was just absolutely incredible. You know, I love um, the wisdom about the tribute, the story of the tribute. And uh, the, the religion scholar said to him, who should we give uh, taxes to? Should we pay taxes, you know, give unto God or pay taxes to Caesar? And he knew it was a trap. So he, he showed a miracle, and he basically um, got a coin from the mouth of a fish. And he said, what is, whose head is on the coin? And they said, well, it's Caesar's head. So he said, then give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and give unto God what is God's. Well, I tell you, that is wisdom. That is amazing wisdom. And these same scholars came to him again and said, tell us, teacher, how could you summarize what we should do? If we are... If you are our Lord, if, if God is our Lord, what should we do? How do we do that? Because they had so many different commandments. If you read through the books of um, Exodus and Leviticus, and uh, there are so many rules and regulations that they had all grown up with and they'd sort of inherited that God had given to them. But Jesus said, we can summarize it into these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your passion. I think we did that a bit this morning. I felt passionate about it this morning when I was worshipping. With all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. Love others as you love yourself. There's no commandment that ranks with these. There's no commandment that ranks with these, those two things. It doesn't say love people who are easy to love or love people who agree with us. Or love people because, well, we see things a certain way and we're going to identify with these people over here because they see things the same way as we see them. But those people over there, no, not so much. I don't see that in that statement. I don't see that anywhere. I just see love people as you love yourself. That's how we do this. That's how we observe lordship to Jesus Christ and to Father God. We love God with all our heart, with everything that we have. And we love others. I heard a story uh, many years ago. I can't remember the exact details, but it was from a man who, it was from, I think, the northwest coast of America, where they'd had an amazing transformation in their church. And they, they began to see miracles. They began to see massive salvation. They just began to see a real move of God. And I remember saying to him, well, how did it start? Did someone preach good? Did the worship leader just suddenly get anointed and that changed everything? He said, no. He said, this is how it started. He said, we began to understand, love others as you love yourself. He said, do you know what? When you really search your own heart, the amount of times that we come from ourself first and others second, he said, it will shock you. It will shock you to your core. He said, and we need a, we need a revelation of this as a church, that to love others means that we start from the position of, how does the other person feel about this? 
What does the other person think about this? You know, put my own needs and requirements and my own thoughts aside. Let me think from the other person's point of view. He said, and that spread like fire through our church. He said, and you actually couldn't stop the presence of God. You couldn't stop the move of God from coming through our church. He said, because we understood it was about other people. Wow. That, that, is, that may seem simple. And it's two, two little commandments. They are powerful, though. If you feel prepared to say, I want to find a way to honor those two commandments in my life more, I'd like you just to stand. the presence of God is in this uh, room because I felt it earlier when we worshipped and it's still here I feel the presence of God if as you're sitting standing there that you feel the presence of God what I'd like to just conclude this really is I'd like two people to come and pray one to pray the first part over us that we'll find ways to love God with all our passion and prayer and intelligence and all of our energy And a second person to come and pray over us that we'll all find a way to love each other better than we've loved before. To think of others before we think of ourselves. To get rid of self. So when I ask um, for those two people, if you feel something in your spirit, rising up in your spirit, you feel like an anointing on you. It's almost like an excitement that's inside of you. You think, I've really got to pray for this. I really want to bring something here over the whole church. That's what I'm looking for. Just one person from each of them. But I want somebody who feels the anointing of God on them to come and pray and declare this over the church. So would someone who wants to come and pray for us to be able to love God with all our passion and heart and intelligence more, would you just come to the front, just one person who wants to pray over the microphone that and seal that over the whole church? Hallelujah. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end, God who is all knowing, all seeing knows everything about us, every single person, every single heartbeat in this room, God, you formed when we was all in our mother's womb. God, you so loved the world that you gave your only son that he or she who believes in Jesus Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life. A love so great. And this commandment says that we love you, God, with all our hearts, prayer, passion, and intelligence. And I pray for everybody in this room today, God, that you give us a revelation of how to do that. As we dig into your word, as we hear your voice, as we tune into your spirit, God, that you allow us to love you the way you ought to be loved. That's with all our hearts, God. Without our heart, Lord God, we're dead. We can't function. And you want us to love us with all of it. You've made us with intelligence, God. That we can do things from our jobs to the way we love our families. The way man can create, God, is in your image. So with all our intelligence, allow us to comprehend how to love you as well, God. Passion is something that you have given and blessed us all with, God whether it lies dormant, whether it's active. Lord, I pray that those dormant 
spirits that have allowed us to stay dormant, God, that you just raise up the passion in all of us right now, God. That passion, mighty God, that gets us up in the midnight hour. That passion, Heavenly Father, that makes demons flee. That passion, Heavenly Father, God, that allows us to rise up no matter what we're going for, God. That that passion, God, will seize and connect us so strongly to you, God, that miracles will happen, God. When we love you with all our hearts, when we love you with all our intelligence, when we love you with all our passion, God, miracles happen. And I pray right now, Jesus Christ, that we can do that and access your throne, God. So Lord, ignite our spirits to do that, God. And bless us so we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. So to the second one. And in some ways, that's the harder one to do. It's quite easy to love a God who's perfect, and we know loves us. Not so easy to love people who are not perfect and may not love us in the same way. I don't want us to disrespect God here. It's easy to stand up uh, because everyone else is standing up. But I just want everyone to close their eyes. This next prayer is going to mean you've got to do some things differently in your life. You've got to begin to approach other people a little differently. I, I remember the words of that man who told me about what happened in his church. They had a revelation of preferring the other, finding the fault in themselves first. Finding the fault in themselves first. Don't immediately think that person's wrong. Just think, this isn't working right. What, what, have I do, what am I doing to contribute to the why this isn't working right? Begin to think about the log in our own eye before we look at the speck in that brother. If you're not able to, when this prayer is prayed, if you're not able to say, I'm going to, I resolve, I resolve to do something different in the way I approach other people, don't disrespect God. Please just sit down. There's no shame in that. If you don't feel able to be able to do that, I don't want us standing here just because everybody else is standing here. We're making a declaration together here as a church, and it is, there is absolutely no shame if you feel unable to be a part of that. So please don't stand during this prayer if you don't feel able to make a change to the way that you think and feel about other people. Is there someone who feels in them that they just need to come and pray? about the way that we as a church together, and this is really important business here, we're doing some, let's call it business in front of God, because we're resolving ourselves as a church to be different with each other. Is there someone who feels just an anointing on them to come and pray this prayer over? over? Hey, what a great person to pray. <laughs> Bless you, mate. Father, I want to bless you this morning. We thank you for your word that came with power. We thank you for the revelation that comes through the teaching of your word. And Father, I want to thank you because you are love personified. Your word says God is love. And that same love you have shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. For your word says that same love is it's been poured out in our heart. Every single one of us, we have a measure of that love. But one thing we want to ask for to this morning, that you help us by grace to perfect that same love in our heart in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord God, this morning, because we know what your love is, your love is patient. Lord, help us to be patient with ourselves, to be patient with our neighbors in the mighty name of Jesus. We also know that your love is kind. Lord, from this house, as we relate with ourselves, let kindness be the order of the day as we relate with ourselves in Jesus' name. Your love is also, does not envy. And Lord, we pray that God, you perfect that love, that God will not be envious of ourselves in the name of Jesus. It also says the love of God is not boastful. Lord, we pray that that grace not to be boastful. Lord, in our relationship, give to us in the name of Jesus. We also pray that you perfect such love that God will not be proud in the name of Jesus. And Father, we also pray, according to your love, that your love does not dishonor others. Lord, we pray that God, you perfect this kind of love in our hearts, that we learn to honor ourselves and not dishonor ourselves in Jesus' name. Your word also said, God's kind of love is not self-seeking. 
Lord, in our relationship, we pray that you help us this day. From this day onward, that God will not be self-seeking people, but Lord, seeking the good of others. In the mighty name of Jesus. And also it says, your love is not easily angered. Lord, we pray for that ability, for that grace, not to be easily angered in our relationship. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, your love also is not does not keep record of wrongs. It is true we can be offended, but Lord, keeping records of offense and keeping records of wrongs is what love does not do. And therefore we pray this day that the ability and the grace not to keep record of wrongs that you give to us in the name of Jesus. Also, your love does not delight in evil. That in this house, as we walk in love, we take no delight in doing evil to our neighbors. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Also, your love rejoices in the truth. Lord, occasionally or often, your word is being taught from this place. Lord, we just pray that God, you give us that heart, that delight in hearing the truth. Every time, not occasionally. In the precious name of Jesus. Your love protects. May that be our story that we learn to protect our neighbors and our friends. And everyone around us in Jesus' name. Your love also trusts, your love hopes, and your love persevere. The ability to persevere in our relationship with others, the Lord let it be perfected in our hearts. And lastly, love does not fail. And so that is our story from this day onward in Jesus' name.